Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit MagnaGrip.com. So good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on wherever and whenever you're listening. Uh, I'll once again start with gratitude and thank everybody for tuning into the Perspective on Leadership podcast brought to you by Fire Engineering. I say this all the time, but you, you guys have a choice, a huge choice of all the podcasts that are out there in which you can choose and listen to, and I am honored that you're choosing to listen to this one. Um, my name is Steve Shaw. I'm very proud to be an assistant chief of Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue. And I'm also honored to be part of the Fire Engineering family as an author, presenter at FDIC, and a host for this podcast. Um, Chief Halton, years a couple of years ago, year, yeah, a couple of years ago at this point, um, you know, he passed away a couple uh, last year. And one thing he told me that I it just resonates in my mind all the time was that FDIC was a tactics conference, and no matter what we did, taught, presented, spoke on, we should always be focused on those tactics, those tactical things you're walking away from. And so for the listeners or the readers to model and deploy these in the real world. So in his honor, I will always continue to focus on those tactics as well as the concepts. Um, just like every every month we do this, perspective is my passion. It, my personal journey as a student of leadership, I, I continue to be fascinated by how perspective affects our ability to lead. Uh, the goal for this podcast is always the same as it's been on day one, to take a concept or a trait that we associate with leadership and take a deep dive down that rabbit hole. There are so many amazing leaders out there in our fire service, and I'm going to pick their brains and allow them to provide as many tactical, immediately deployable takeaways as possible to the listener. I'm grateful to David Rhodes, Diane Rothschild, and the Clarion team, and especially my agency, Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue, for allowing me to continue to have this platform so that I could do my part to pass it on to my brothers and sisters in the fire service. So last month, uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to dive into the origin story of the Fools, and I was with John Bart Simpson and Walt Lewis, two of the founding fools. And one person we mentioned during the conversation was Rusty Ricker from the Northeast Fools. And, um, and I met Rusty for the first time uh, a couple years back, having the honor of presenting at the 2022 Northeastern Fire Summit, presented by the New England chapter of the Fools, which Rusty is the current president. And for those of you who don't know, the Northeast Fire Summit is three days of training and presentation in Wells, Maine. And this year it's from March 8th through 10th, and all the information can be found online. And we'll definitely be talking about that uh, closer to the end of this. Um, but what I remember about this conference for, for many reasons, especially because how cold it was, uh, but more impactful were the firefighters who attended the conference. I, I was floored by this. I was floored by the level of attention and their focus. I mean, there was over 100 firefighters in the room, and they were all laser focused on the content. Every presenter, every every but they got up and did something. They were just laser focused the entire three days. And I've never seen that. Um, and I remember just scanning the room and I was speaking and not a single eye was on a tablet or a screen or a computer. They were all facing forward. They were all engaged. And I remember thinking, what is going on up here to drive or create or foster that level of motivation? So one of the ideas we spoke of last month was engagement. And I've been dwelling on this topic since we recorded the last show engagement. You know, I asked myself, I would ask that if you haven't listened, first of all, to the podcast from last month, check it out. But one thing that Walton Barr covered that led to this successful full chapter was the idea of engagement. So as a student of the fire service, I reflected heavily in that. And, and am I creating an environment of engagement? Am I communicating regularly and fostering trust? Am I engaging with my family when I'm home? And I'm, am I all in when I'm at work? And am I all in when I'm at home? So I, I called Rusty and asked him if he would be a guest this month so we could talk about that idea of an engagement a little bit more. So before I give him the mic, so Rusty Ricker is a third generation firefighter with over 30 years of experience in the fire service. Having begun his career as a call fireman in his hometown, he is currently employed as a career firefighter paramedic in Metro Boston. He is also the president and the founder of the New England chapter of Fools International. So before I give him the mic, um, there was just three things I was thinking of prior to our discussion today. First of all, is the idea that engagement is part of building a culture. And as I focus on the various areas under my charge, 
I ask myself more than ever, am I engaged with my team? Am I engaged with my family? What does engagement look like? So I'm really looking forward to dive into this. The second thing I was thinking of was Chief Rhodes' editor's opinion in the Fire Engineering Magazine in January titled Your Local Training Conference. And I'm so glad that he focused on the importance and prevalence of the local training conferences that are out there, regardless of the size or just how important these are. In South Florida, we're blessed because we have so many of these around the corner. I mean, it seems like every month something's popping up, from EMS to fire, hazmat, you name it. There's always something going on, and that's wonderful. Um, and the third thing is, and this kind of combines those two concepts, was the idea of this plus one mentality. So this is going to be a topic of a future podcast, but the idea of engagement plus what Chief Rhodes' words had, had me thinking of the, the multiple ways we can increase the, the power and number of our groups, our teams, our committees, and, and all that, and how we are going to, and what we're going to talk about today, aids in succession planning, empowering those uh, who eventually take our role one day, so whatever they may be. So Rusty, uh, thank you for joining me today. I'm, I'm excited to talk about a bunch of things, including engagement, but thank you for taking the time to join me today, sir. No, th thanks for having me on. Uh, it, it was an honor to be asked, honor to, um, to to be here with you today, and especially following on the heels of of Bart and Walt, who are uh, giants in the world of the fools. Uh, Walt's actually speaking for us this year about the the Northeastern Fire Summit. Walt is actually returning this year as a as a presenter for us. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I know him pretty well. We run in the same circle down here in South Florida, but. And I, I don't mean to, to, to harp on it, but that's an amazing conference you got up there, man. It, I was just so impressed by everything that that conference had. And I know we'll talk about it more, but um, and that's kind of why we're here talking about this today is what leads to that that engagement, that 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 uh, with itness that all those folk had up there. So um, but, yeah, thanks for joining me today. I, I'd like to start off with something we talked about before. And you mentioned that you were a third generation firefighter. So I'd like to just dive into your history a little bit. So what did that look like growing up? I mean, was it even a choice not to get into the fire department? It wasn't. It wasn't. I'm not a direct third generation. My dad was, oh, my, sorry, my grandfather started in 1940. My dad got on in the early 60s. Both had since gotten through long before I got interested. Um, I still had uncles and cousins that were um, very, very engaged still in the fire service, but it was that step back. So it wasn't like I was always on fire scenes. I wasn't going to calls with my dad, with my granddad or anything like that, but it was always there. It was in the family, the family history. So it really wasn't much of a surprise when I walked in the station um, at, you know, 18 and a half, everybody there had worked with, with my dad, with my uncles and cousins and looked at me and said, well, what took you so long? <laughs> so, and it's, I will say from a family standpoint, it's not just that direct lineage on my paternal side, but on my mom's side, we go back to the 1800s in Southern New Hampshire. I had family on the Exeter fire department in the 1880s. And my great uncle was one of the first paid drivers in, for the Northampton, New Hampshire fire department as well which was kind of cool because I asked the chief who's a chapter member and a friend if he'd ever heard of the name. And 10 minutes later, he sent me a picture of my great uncle sitting in the watch room, sipping a cup of coffee, wow. which was, which was That's pretty cool. special. <laughs> no, I, I think about that a lot these days. You know, I, um, uh, right now I got, um, uh, my brothers in Miami Dade, I got three cousins that are working for other departments around the area. So right now it's really heavily involved in my family as well. My father was, we, we started as volunteer firefighters together. In Coral Springs, he kind of pushed me to do it when I wasn't seeing what the value of it was, and then when I got in there, I'm like, "Oh yeah, this is cool. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life." So I thank him for for doing that. And as I have the kids that are growing up now, uh, some of my my brothers and my friends' kids are getting to that age where now they're deciding what to do. So it's really cool to see what are going to be like second generation and so on and so forth. So, um, and, but uh, going back to um, some of the things we were talking about just earlier with like the conference and what. I, I know I mentioned it before, but um, that experience in, in 2022, I still brag about that, by the way. Every time I talk to people, I'm like, man, you got to check out this conference. I don't know what they're doing right up there, but they're doing something right. And that's kind of what the purpose of this podcast is. Um, I mean, the level of professionalism, the attention, the focus, 100 firefighters in the room, three days they were present for and just dialed in the entire time. And we've both been to a bunch of conferences. 
I've never seen participation like that before. I mean, we were talking about this before the show, how you'll scan the room sometimes and there's mostly engaged people. Sometimes people on their tablets, sometimes people on a computer, making a phone call, getting up and leaving, coming back. But this was different, man. These guys were dialed the heck in. So break that down for me, man. What is going on up that way that drives that level of into the jobness, I guess? I think it's just the audience that we attract. I think we're very blessed with the fact that we bring people what they want to see and who they want to hear, yourself included. And um, they show up every time for us. And, and, you know, we deliver, they deliver, essentially. I think you're talking about laser focused. Um, the, the one that really blew my mind was a couple of years before you spoke was um, Stevie Gillespie had come up and given his uh, post-traumatic growth lecture. And Stevie's story is powerful. And if you've never heard it, um, I, I urge anyone to look it up, to to see him speak. He's a battalion chief currently down at Goose Creek, South Carolina. He's retired lieutenant from uh, from the FDNY. Stephen has had an incredible career, but his story is, is, is next level. And, you know, you, you say everybody's on tablets or whatever. There wasn't even anybody clicking or tapping a pen for the two hours that Steve spoke that, that one particular lecture. And that's the one that really sticks in my mind as to the level of engagement, because it was the first time he'd ever presented it in front of people. And Steve's a friend. Steve's been a good friend for years. And um, to give him that opportunity for me was special, but it was incredible to see that everyone else in that room thought it was just as special as I did. Um, and a lot of times with, with who comes and speaks and the presentations that are made and the presentations that are given, it's just our friends that maybe are speaking at FDIC or are shaking out a presentation that they want to present at FDIC or any of the other conferences that have, we give the opportunity to, to come up and, and speak. You know, we pull the audience as to who else we can fill in with and a name will pop up like Steve Shaw, for instance, you got to get this guy up to, to, to speak was what I was told. Um, and lo and behold, up you came and gave out soap and we had a great time. <laughs> yeah, it's another another podcast uh, for another day. That the soap thing. Yeah, <laughs> everybody's gonna have their hobbies, right? Some people, right? some people hunt. I make soap and beer at home. It's, it's a weird thing. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, but but on that level, it's like that. Then that's the whole thing. You're going up there, and we were talking about this before, and talk about the the effect, impact and the effectiveness of the structure can have. And yeah, there's always a, a good variety of people that are there. We were talking about. Um, the, I guess it was Timmy Klett who on Saturday night was there uh, during the time I was there. And I remember talking to him beforehand. We were joking around because during those three days, that Friday night, all day Saturday, including into the evening, and then on Sunday, presenters were doing their thing. And everybody the entire time was just laser focused. It was crazy. But I remember talking to Timmy going, oh, man, that sucks for you. You got the last you got the last slot on Saturday during dinner time. My God, are they even going to be awake at that point? I mean, they've had a whole day of training. They're tired. They're, they're saturated with all this information. Man, you, you're good, but I don't know if you're that good. But watching him do his thing that evening, not only is he that good, because he is just, a, like you said, a, he's just a, a show. He's, he's a dinner and a show, dinner and a movie. But not only is he that good, but yes, everybody was still focused after a whole day of being there, the entire day, soaking in all that information. They were just as engaged that evening as they were the, the, the start of the conference. And I was just floored by that. You don't see that everywhere. We've had very good luck. And, you know, on Saturday, Saturday evening we end, and then Sunday morning we're right back into it for another, for another lecture or two. And they're right there as engaged on Saturday. I'm sorry, on Sunday, as they are on Saturday, and nobody's rushing to get out the door. Nobody's, oh, man, I got to go to work. I got to go. I'm on shift tonight. They're, they are there, um, which, again, I, I'm not quite sure what the magic is or the mystery is to it, but we bring in good people, and we tend to attract good people. So I, I think that's the, 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 the key to it is, Nobody's being forced to be there. 
No one's forced to be there. They're there of their own free will, of their own volition, and most of them are paying their own money to be there. So they're taking their time. They're taking their money. They're making, yeah, they're spending their money, and they're there for all the right reasons, which, as we say, at every hands-on that we do, in every lecture series that we do, the people that need to hear that stuff aren't the ones that are there. But hopefully those people that are there take it back and tell 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 their coworkers about what they missed and maybe those are the people that show up the next year or at the next event you bring up a good point uh that's something we hear all the time and whether it's the smaller conferences or a larger one like fbsc that's something that we hear all the time the people that need to be here aren't here but that's not a statement it's, it's a call to action what else do we do what else do we do to increase those numbers to take those people that maybe should be here how do we engage with those and i guess that brings me into the next question our next topic is, um, you know, diving further into that importance of being engaged and or, or creating engagement. Um, I, I know that it's definitely part of what's driving that level of, of involvement up your way. So for you, and I know that I think that Walt and, and, um, and Bart kind of gave me some idea of what that kind of looked like. In other words, you guys up there are not just putting on training events. It's a whole slew of things throughout a time frame throughout the year. Can you kind of dive yes. into what that looks like throughout the year? So we don't really have any set schedule per se. I know last year, last year was our 20th anniversary. So we tried to do, we represent, we represent all six New England states. And at the conference last year, we took on the Canadian Maritime Provinces as well. So we, we went international last year. Um, we had a half a dozen guys down from, from, New Brunswick, and they asked how they could join our chapter if they could, because the chapter that was up there had uh, had folded. I said, geez, I don't know. I sent a text to uh, the president and the vice president of international and asked. They say, hey, we don't see any borders if you don't. So on Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, we went international, which is kind of cool. So um, we our goal last year was to do something for our 20th anniversary in all six New England states. Um, we, we succeeded, but we failed. We didn't get into all six New England states, um, but we're making up for it this year early by um, we've already got some plans to, to get into places that we weren't last year. Um, we do, the, the biggest set thing that we do is we've been doing it for almost our existence. So 2004 was the first time we did a hands-on training. And we called it our spring training because we were the first ones out there doing it. None of the county attack schools were out. None of the state schools were out yet. So we were doing it that that first weekend in April-ish. So we called it spring training. And we've done it pretty much every year since then it, as a hands-on event. Uh, 2012, we began the Northeastern Fire Summit as, as a venture. We were doing it in February. We found that we were fighting the weather a little bit, so we pushed it back to early March. And thank you for that. Thank um, you for that. Yes. And like I said, last year we got a foot of snow on Saturday. So, <laughs> um, but so that's really the, the the big set thing that we do is is the summit, and we try to do a hands on in either April or May. Um, we tend to avoid July and August, just because of vacations and well, it's hot. Um, September, we, we, we've always done, geez, for the last 14 years now, I think we, we do a class for York County, Maine, their chiefs, um, fire attack school weekend. We do a hands-on for them every year in late September. This will be the fourth year we'll be going up towards Bangor, Maine. Um, so way up North to do a hands-on, um, we'll be in Ellsworth again this year towards you know late october which has been a like i said the, this this will be the fourth year we've done that just we've we've called it our fireman ship event you know a little take on fireman ship but um we did it in bangor last year and three four years ago we did it as a straight lecture um two years ago we did it three years ago we did it in in ellsworth we did it as a friday afternoon a couple of lectures and then a day and a half of hands-on training and then it, it, it worked well. It gave, it exposed a different area of our membership to us 
because a lot of times people don't travel down to Mass or even even New Hampshire to train if they're if they're from, you know, up Maine, if you will. And um, it, it gave us a pretty good um, destination to be as well. I mean, we were in Ellsworth. We had four guys from Chatham, Mass, which if you know where Chatham, Mass is, it's on Cape Cod. They probably would have been better off taking a boat than taking the Chiefs car that they did and gotten there in a more timely fashion. But they were willing to travel. We were willing to host. So there we all were. So we, so far this year, we've already done, we had a, a target of opportunity in very early January on the New Hampshire seacoast. Uh, the Newcastle, New Hampshire chief was good enough to contact us about a, an acquired structure that he had. And we were doing hands-on evolutions in an 1880s seaside mansion, which was incredible. I mean, you can go on to our, into our Facebook and see some of the, uh, some of the pictures, it was just, we weren't able to burn in it, but we were able to do some hands-on evolutions in a building that it, it physically hurt to open up the walls. It was so nice of a place. Um, the guy that bought it has more money than knows what to do with. So he didn't like it. It didn't fit with his aesthetics. So he was tearing it down and building another one. Um, to, to give you an idea of the kind of neighborhood it is, the bass player for Def Leppard lives across the street. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> trailer park, just one step from a trailer park. Right? <laughs> right. So, we, we were lucky enough to get into that. Um, he actually has another acquired for us before the, um, before the summertime hits. Uh, we'll be going up into Vermont. We have um, an acquired structure we're actually be doing live fire in, or a couple of acquired structures we're going to be doing live fire in at some point in early May. Um, we just booked out um, – a commercial fireground operations class in a big commercial building in Central Mass for early April before FDIC, as well as the 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 Northeastern Fire Summit, which is the eighth, like you said, the eighth to the tenth of March. So so far we're busy and we're catching up with the places that we weren't able to get into last year. You know, first of all, I will say God bless all those who supply acquired structures for us. I mean, and I know some people can't do that. Some states won't even allow them. For us in, in Florida, it's hit or miss. I know in South Florida, in, if there's a handful of departments that can and some that cannot. We in Fort Lauderdale have a tremendous SOP to allow us to do that. And we're very structured, very careful when we do it, but we're blessed to be able to do those. And with all the building going on out there, we're, we're greeted with acquired structure or the, at least the opportunity to do multiple acquired structure training on a regular basis. Now, whether that's, like you said, sometimes we can burn them, sometimes we can't. But even if you can't burn an acquired structure, there's so much you can do with them that I, I just, I hold the people that give us those acquired structures on a pedestal. I mean, they, I don't think they realize what impact that has for us. How, how valuable it really is. So this one that we had in Newcastle in, in January, um, we actually got, so we were going to do it, we were going to do a single day class twice we do the same class on saturday that we did on sunday or sunday that we did on saturday but we ended up with a major snowstorm moving in saturday as we we're finishing so we canceled on sunday which really wasn't a big deal but what it allowed us to do was we did a little bit more on saturday than we would have otherwise so we got into breaching some walls pulling some ceilings opening up well we found different types of building construction and we exposed some guys to different types of building construction that they'd never seen horsehair and plaster lath wire mesh lath and all these things that you find in some of these old old houses up around us that you don't know is behind the walls which was great i mean we really we opened some stuff up <laughs> oh and you know you can only do so much in a burn building or a conics box exactly. or a fire academy you know What's what's a what's a burn building set up as? What's the fire academy set up as? It's not set up as the two story, two and a half story frames that you're going to in your first do. It's set up as the fire academy. It's set up as a burn building. There are very few that are actually true, true to form set up to the buildings that we're responding to. Very few, which is a shame, but it's a fact. Yeah. And, and I think that it, it's and, and we can talk about this all day, but it's a combination. We're very blessed with. Some of the structures we have for training facilities out here. In fact, um, the previous training bureau that just uh, went back to the field, they did a phenomenal job in our area, uh, finally putting together a wonderful uh, Connex Box City in our Wellfield area. And it's just, it's amazing what they're able to do out there. And I, I'm a very big proponent of it. 
But that being said, the, those acquired structures, like you just said, in terms of breaching walls and seeing what it actually looks like, everything from the electric to the roofs to the floors to all of that, it's just you can't you can't replicate that. And going back to what uh, Chief Rhodes was saying about those local fire conferences, I mean, it's 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 your locality. It's what you're going to be responding to. I mean, the the acquired structures we get. For the most part in South Florida, the, our standard single story, single family homes are CBS block with a wood roof. And that's generally what they have. And we have a couple of wood structures out there, maybe that haven't been blown down by hurricanes through the years and a couple of tongue roof, uh, roofs left. But for the most part, just these, these big boxes full of, of concrete. And that's fine. But every time we get a chance to have those acquired structures, I mean, for me at the, in the administration level, it's a pain in the ass. To have to do all that paperwork, get it signed by the city manager, get it signed by legal, and blah, blah, blah. But I'm willing to do the work because I know how much value they bring to everybody involved. So I'm a big fan of acquired structures. I'm glad you, you brought that up. As are we. And it's it's something that, like you said, it's feast or famine. It's head or miss. We haven't been lucky through the years or we haven't been as lucky through the years as we this, it seems like they've all just fallen in our lap these, these last few weeks, which is fantastic. Although I will say, you know, Mike Gilbert, one of the other founding fools out of, uh, he was out of Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Mike, uh, Mike came to an acquired that we had back in 2007, and he found out that water freezes below 32 degrees. Uh, one of our members called us. And he said, uh, he said, I got a three-story atrium hotel. We can do anything in it but burn. What do you think? Mm -hmm. So I think I'll call you back in a couple of minutes. Hung up with him, started making phone calls to get instructors lined up, called him back as we are in. So we had Gilbert came up, Bart came up. We had a few of the the heavy hitters in, in, in terms of the fools, as well as instructors from all over. But Mike found out the hard way at that particular required that water freezes and is very slippery below 32 degrees. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what that looks like. I have no idea what that looks like. And I, and I, I am very appreciative for where I live. I'm very, I, I respect the hell out of everybody that has to deal with that. And, and even when we we're talking about like the different weather conditions, I guess as much as I'm uh, very happy, I don't have to deal with what you do up there. I'm sure people don't want to deal with the hurricanes we have to deal with down here every so often. Those can be long-term pains in the butt, to say the least. A, a blizzard never blew my house away. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you know, but I, I, I and you were talking about the wireless fire hydrants before we came on. Yeah, the um, the um, the the Floridians at that particular training and back in two thousand seven were trying to figure out why they had shovels in the on the step of the engine, but because we had to shovel the hydrants out every once in a while, and that the whole concept of that was foreign to them. Oh, yeah. It was they were their minds were blown. It was pretty funny. Yeah, I was uh, I was attending a. Um, that class in Pueblo, Colorado, that uh, that um, federally funded class uh, for, I think it was Hazmat years ago for in Pueblo. And as I'm driving the, the rental car up to Pueblo from the airport, I'm with another firefighter who happens to live around the area. And there's ice on the, the front windshield. So he looks at me and goes, grab me the ice scraper. I'm like, the what? He goes, grab me the ice scraper. I'm like, what? What? I don't know. And he's almost yelling at me. He goes, Steve, give me the ice scraper. It's right next to you. I go, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what it is. I thought it was like a dog comb or something. I had no idea what it was. I'm like, oh, this is an ice scraper. Here you go. So it's amazing. What show you know what that is. <laughs> um, but, but going further with this idea of engagement. Um, so in, in our, and I mentioned this before, in our area in South Florida, we're, we're blessed. Um, uh, the the chapter down here in the South Florida pools they're they're amazing and just watching them especially in the last few years just flourish has been something of a blessing I mean uh, from uh, Mickey Tefexis uh, giving it to Max Flash and all the people involved with that group right there um, they've just done such amazing work with what they're providing and it, it went from just providing an occasional class to collaborating with like Florida Fire Chiefs not Florida Fire Chiefs but the the Broward County Association of Fire Chiefs and their training group, and then doing more training and more training. And it seems like the, the what they have lined up last year and going into this year has just grown and grown. But going to kind of what you were saying, they've just been, it's been constant. It has been sporadic in nature. It's been like you expect this is going to be a busy year. There's going to be multiple events throughout the year. And it's just, it's just we know we, we are expecting something. In other words, they've, they've generated a groundswell. They've generated some momentum right there. But I know it's not all like just a training. What else would you say? And I ask this definitely for, for, for 
for learning purposes because as Max has taken over and he's got his own vision of how he's going to, to grow and enthuse that. And in general, talking about just engagement in general with our teams, with our groups, with our special ops teams, with our training teams, whatever they look like, what else works? What else are some things that we can do to drive that engagement? What else comes to your mind? I think with us, with the fools, is what we bring to the table is that we're, or we try to be, everything that maybe your home department isn't, everything that you wish that your home department could be, everything that you envision your job to be, we try to be that. We try to bring the honor, the traditions, the, the, the service, the duty, all of that we roll into the package that is the fools, but we can do that without having to worry about vacation time and who's getting paid what and writing assignments and all the other, you know, BS, I guess, if you will, that comes along with the necessary BS of your job, we can cut out and bring to the table. We are everything that's good about the, the fools in general, not just the New England fools, but the fools in general is everything that's good about the fire service. And I think that takes a special level of engagement. It's not for everybody. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, there was a time that um, I'm trying to think if I can come up with the exact quote. Um, I can't, so I won't even bother. But it, called zealots called you know all kinds of other crazy stuff because we were into the job and not everybody's into the job and sometimes you need to be into the job to be onto the job and some people it is just a schedule and benefits and those people don't come around to fools conferences and fools trainings very often because they find that they're voices aren't heard or their voices miss maybe necessarily aren't the ones that are being heard or spoken of in the settings that the fools bring no, I, I, that makes a lot of sense i mean when you're there you're with a group of people that want to be there they're they're, they're already in the job you're surrounding yeah. yourself with that that group that, that that feeling i mean it's a battery recharge for everybody every time you go to a fool's event, it's a battery recharge, whether it's a single day, whether it's an evening thing, or whether it's a full weekend, it is an absolute battery recharge of all that's good about the job. And you you take that, and you, you fly home on that high and ride it for a few weeks, hopefully. And hopefully you can turn that around and engage it back at your own place. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, but that's the goal. So you mentioned before, you know, in terms of building this, you had a lot of people involved right now. Uh, I'd like to dive into just a little bit more specifics. Like for me, what I try to do these days, and um, I actually got this one from Rick Stilp, who uh, retired Orlando, just recently passed away, big of the hazmat community. But one of the things he told me years ago was that one of the things he tries to do every conference he goes to is he tries to co-teach with people. He'll bring somebody that's an up-and-comer or starting to get comfortable with teaching and co-teach. He'll have them with him doing a class, whether it's a section of it, part of it, whatever, but he gives them the audience, the opportunity to step in front of people to just get their feet wet, if you will. And I find when he told me that, I'm like, why am I not doing that? Why am I not doing that more? So now I try religiously to do that. And I've done that a couple of times uh, in the last year. And I just did it at the beginning of this year with one of my new uh, chiefs, the idea of trying to bring them into the fold. Uh, so that's one of the, the tactical ways I'm trying to Drum up engagement, uh, succession plan, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, did anything come? To, do anything? Does anything come to your mind? It's like some tactical ways to deploy that, like for the guys that are coming to these events or in general. Well, that was one of the reasons for bringing the leadership. So we changed it up a little bit. You were there in twenty two, um, in twenty three at the summit conference. We uh, we changed it up a little bit. Um, we felt that the leadership was more important than maybe a lecture or two. So we split the audience. Um, we have a smaller leadership track available and there's a small room upstairs that holds about 50 people. We stuffed about 70 into it last year um, and still had a full room downstairs in that main ballroom for what we call our tactical track. So we split tactical and leadership 
tracked. And it worked. It worked very well last year, and we did the same thing this year. Um, and actually, what we found the best way to to expand it is we're doing a couple of pre-conference speakers on Friday, one in each track prior to the the keynote address Friday evening. So to get to 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 pack even more into that weekend, that's how we're doing it. But that leadership track is an opportunity for those those next tomorrow's leaders to 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 learn from guys that are out there doing it we have uh rob moran chief robert moran from um down on the cape we got walt lewis um richie stack from chicago former fools international president mm -hmm. and i cannot for the life of me think of the fourth person in the leadership track this year anthony avillo gotcha. is the fourth person in the leadership track this year and the fifth for the pre-conference is actually um local to us is um a local public relations forum firm runs our website for us and he's a phenomenal guy great company very very personal very personable one of their representatives is going to be talking about the importance of a pio and how to interact with that PIO, with the departments, with the media for this year's, for, you know, this year's conference in the leadership, because it's something that's fairly new to us. It's not necessarily new, you know, to a Florida, to a California, but up in the Northeast, it's, it's, I won't say it's a foreign concept, but it's a fairly new concept. No, that actually makes a lot of sense. And, and being involved in a lot of the conference, uh, not only in the conference circuit, but being involved in the background of some of the conferences out here, it seems to be a growing trend where they're trying to diversify the content to attract multiple people from the area. You know, they're, they're, they're basically taking the pulse of the area and saying, what do you want to learn? What do you need to learn? I mean, we did this, uh, I think five years ago, no, it was more than five years ago. I was, I was the chair of the training group here in um, the uh, Fire Chief Association of Broward County. And we did two days of training. And the first day of training, we had a Billy Goldfeder commit. And it was, you know, Billy draws a crowd. He's amazing. He's a good, good cat, good content, funny as all hell. And he actually spent some time working down here years ago when he first started. So there was a little bit of bond there. But the second day was interesting. We had um, some local people doing something on high rises and stamp pipes and sprinklers and FDCs and all that jazz. It was interesting because the first day of class, we knew we'd get a lot of traction with Billy. So I think we planned for, let's say, somewhere around 2, 250. And we got a little bit less than we thought, which is expected. On the second day, because we had polled the, the area, we said, what do you want to hear? What do you need to hear? The, the, the resounding response was, I don't know enough about standpipes. I don't know how to adjust the field adjustable FDCs and, 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 and those, all that stuff. And like, oh, okay. So we expected 100 people on day two. We got 120. We got more people than we expected because there was that draw. They wanted to hear that. That's what they wanted to hear. Exactly. So the same thing we're talking about, diversifying the content to draw more people. What you're doing is is – in line with what we're seeing all the time out there. And uh, if some of the conferences here, whether EMS, fire, whatever, that's what they're doing. And they seem to be drawing a lot more people into the fold. And not only now are they there for what they're there for, they can cross pollinate. They can see people they know, they can hop into another class. And it's it's a good trend. So it's exactly what you're, you're doing right there. It's perfect. Um, and we try to do every year, one of the, to diversify a little bit, we try to focus on us. We lost one of our, our good friends in the chapter to, to suicide in 2017. And since 2018, one of the big focuses, at least one speaker has been on mental health. And uh, to, we do that to for us in general, but we also do it to, to honor PJ and his memory as, as we make sure that it's not just all about, you know, throwing ladders and stretching lines. When it comes right down to it, it's about us. You say that, and I remember even when I was there a couple of years ago, um, I forgot, and I, I forgot, I feel terrible for not forgetting her name, but she did the amazing presentation on, on that topic or something along those lines. And I was really intrigued by the conversations afterwards. As you know, she left after interactions. And it's amazing how in different areas of the country, some people are a lot more forward with what they're doing with that, and some people are still trying to catch up. And I heard a lot of the questions, and I, I thought, wow. Uh, and no, nothing against anybody, but I'm like, wow, it's, I'm, I'm happy they're, they're asking those questions. And I remember 
10, 15 years ago, us being the ones to ask those questions and drum up that, that groundswell of what needed to have to be talked about and not making it so taboo, but accepted. And it was nice to hear those questions, people speaking out loud. And then when they spoke it out loud, other people in the same room would, would ask their questions and it was just contagious in a positive way. So yeah, that's huge. Sue Brown was, yeah. was who was there the yes. year you were. Phenomenal. And Phenomenal. She was great. She really was. And on Sunday we had um, Lee and Rick. Yes. George. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Two, two, uh, two fools, old school fools who telling their own stories yeah. hit it out of the park. Yes. Um, they, they, they ended up holding an impromptu session after their lecture with one of our members um, and it was very, very impactful in his life, which that's why we do it, you know, and that was, that was, that meant the world to me to find that out afterwards, um, that we were doing something right. And, you know, I guess you want to talk about engagement to be, to be able to have that level of engagement from somebody just simply sitting through a class and listening to these two guys tell their own story. Um, was pretty incredible. And for that guy to be able to open up afterwards, it, it's like you, you that's the whole point with, with this. And not only, with, like you said, it's not about throwing ladders and pulling lines all the time. It's more than that. And you've created that environment. You've created that level of engagement to allow that person to be vulnerable and to ask questions and to, like you said, allow them to provide that that um, intervention or whatever you want to call it to that guy. And I got to tell you, just listening to that, it, it gives me goosebumps because if that's the only thing that happened throughout that weekend, it was all worth it. It was all worth it. Absolutely. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So, and it, no, go ahead. It, no, no, no. I just, it, that definitely made it worth it to me. It was affirmation that what we, we had made that choice to hold, hold, hold that particular type of topic there. That may be uncomfortable sometimes type of topic was the right thing to do. Yeah. So it's just affirmation. Validating, doing it indicating right. that you did it. Yeah. Absolutely. Huge. Validation, yes. So it, kind of you know, closing a loop here on the engagement, um, you know, when we present on leadership, you know, like when I, when I present on leadership, I always use like a polling tool to ask the audience what they feel are the traits of, of leadership. And engagement does pop up uh, every so often. You know, you have integrity and all the other ones that are pretty much the ones that are out there, but engagement does pop up quite frequently. Um, for you, uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Like, in other words, if you're thinking about the traits that lead to high performing companies or organizations or culture, what, what, what does your mind go to in terms of those traits of leaderships? I think, I think engagement is, is really the right word. I mean, we've used it a lot today, but I think that you need to be engaged. You need to be 100% there. Um, I was lucky enough. I was a high school hockey player. I had Terry O'Reilly was my high school assistant high school hockey coach one year, the year between when he retired from the Bruins and the year between when he took over coaching the Bruins. So if you're, if you're a Boston sports fan, it was pretty special to be able to have this guy be our high school hockey coach. And one of the things that sticks with me from him was be where you are. That didn't really make any sense to me as a, you know, as a 10th grader, but as an adult, be where you are. Um, if you're at work, be at work. And if you can't, well, you have sick time for a reason. I don't need, we don't need someone whose head's not in the game to be in that front seat, in that boss's seat, um, running the show. If, if you're worried about what's going on at home or your finances or, you know, you, you, your dog's pregnant, your wife's pregnant, your girlfriend's pregnant, whatever it might be. Be where you are, be engaged, be at the station, be with your people when your people need you. And to that, I think a lot of old school people get this portion, but it's not always there with our newer leaders is there needs to be a degree of selfishness, selflessness. Not saying that today's leaders are selfish, but there needs to be a degree of selflessness. You need to be willing and able to put the job, the company, the whatever in front of 
everything else, including yourself. And if you can be that type of leader that's all in 100%, then it's going to make you a better leader and it's going to make people want to follow you. And it's hopefully going to improve the other people around you and make them want to lead in that same same style, that same method. I, I'm very happy you, you chose that and, and dove deeper into it. And I, I think about all the things of what that looks like in my mind. I see so many ideas of what that could be. And it could be something as simple as like for me, when I'm in my office and my team, somebody from my team comes in, you know, am I continuing to look at my computer, type it on the screen, or am I focused on them, drop what I'm doing, what do you got? And just focusing on that person. Because if I'm still on my phone, it's still in front of me, if my, my email's beeping, if the phone rings and I get it, it's not it's not the same. They, I, I want to make sure they understand I'm looking them right in the eyes and totally, like you said, I'm being where I, I am. You know, and, and if they're needing my attention, I want to give it to them, make sure they know that I'm there, I'm focused on them. They're there for a reason. What do you need from me? And engage them. So, and, and on a broader scale, you know, modeling that trait. I'm glad. I'm so glad you went there. My mind goes to so many different areas. Like they're all, we're all looking at the leaders. We're all looking at the ones that are supposed to be setting the example, being the model. And what we do is contagious. So if we are the ones that are engaged and communicating and fair. We're modeling to other people around us what that looks like. We're not, even, we're not talking about it. We're doing it. And there's so much power in that. And you're right. I think that. I guess the modeling part is what I go to is like, are we doing that? Are we making sure we're modeling what people need to see? Because a lot of these, I don't want to say younger people, but the, the generations that are coming in now, have they had that experience? Have they had that, whether at their family level, in school, wherever, or were they on their phones the entire time and they're looking down all the time? You know, they need that modeling that we, we're talking about right here. I came in under World War II vets and Korean era war vets in the call, in the call department. I'm sure you did too. And Sunday morning was fire department day. Sunday was. Whether it was drill, training, you know, truck checks, whatever it was, it was Sunday morning. Unless you came in with a cup of coffee, you didn't get a cup of coffee in your hand until the floor was swept. That's how it was. Whether you liked it or not, that's how it was. And I can't see that working today. That's how I was taught, and that's how we were brought up, and it just it's how it was, and that wasn't it wasn't disciplined per se, but it was just how it was, and that was that, and that's how we did it, and nobody questioned, and I don't see that being something that would fly today, right. unfortunately. Yeah, I got you, but but something else you said here, and it, it you. You mentioned something, and it tied directly into it, but the comment of we have sick time for a reason. I think we should probably plaster that around the stations in a variety of different ways. I mean, in talking about being selfless, the, the, and just using this as a very simple example, and I think a lot of us kind of see it differently now that COVID's here and gone, or not gone per se, but for the most part gone, is the idea of, yeah, when you come in not ready to perform, when you're, like you said, not there, whether it's because you're sick or for whatever other reason has taken you away from the job, you're a detriment, whether you're literally passing on a virus to somebody and now they're getting sick and their family's getting sick, or you're endangering your crew because you're not all there. That's the, the definition of, of being selfless. And I, I'm glad you you led with that. That's that's something that needs to be talked about and reminded of people. It's like the idea that you have to, to tell somebody if they're sick, just call in sick, and, and the opposite happens, or vice versa. They, they use sick time for goofy things. We can go on all day about it, but I'm glad you, you led with that and gave an example. Um, so another question I have is, and this has become one of my, my favorite questions so far for the guests. Uh, when you think about everything going on in the fire service these days, do you have any concerns? In other words, uh, does anything keep you up at night these days? <laughs> Not really. Um, every once in a while, you're really reminded how well off we are with the next generation. Um, we, we hired a bunch of guys a couple of years ago now, probably three or four years ago at this point, and hands down the best group of guys I've seen come into an organization in forever, all into the job, want to be on the job, 
want to be there for all the right reasons. Um, they were a breath of fresh air. And we've been very lucky to have brought the, the same quality of people into our organization anyway at work um, <clears throat> for quite a while now. Um, the young guys, we interact a lot with um, Southern Maine Community College has a live-in program. Uh, my youngest son went through it. Um, we interact a lot with them through our hands-on trainings in Southern Maine and in New Hampshire. And what a great bunch of, I'll say kids because they're my kids' age, but what a great bunch of kids to be able to know that we're handing the fire service off to. Um, you know, every once in a while I get a hiccup. They're not maybe the greatest or the smartest group. But you know that the future for this job and this this profession is safe with some of these people that you see come through. Um, so long as we take our job seriously to prepare them the right way and hand off traditions and tell them what needs to be done and why it needs to be done. Um, I, I think we're in good shape. I think that uh, I think that the future is bright, and the brotherhood is strong, even if not everybody always thinks that way. So I'm glad you answered it that way because I think that you you answered it with a caveat. In other words, and I, I and I've seen the same thing down here in, in South Florida, where you got these guys coming on board with a different set of skills, a different skill set. Yes, they may not have started a chainsaw or a, a partner saw in the, in the past, and then we have to teach them that. Yes, they may have a lot to learn in terms of uh, social connections and whatever else. We can go down the line here. But I think that the most powerful thing you said right there, as long as we are doing what we're supposed to do, I think that right there is the perfect way to start uh, kind of closing up this conversation. Are we doing what we are supposed to do, passing on those traditions? And not only teach them the basic skills, but everything else that goes along with that. We we get frustrated, and I hear this a lot from uh, people out there. I'm sure you do too. Where uh, it's it's a class thing. Next generation, they've never done this. They've never done that. They don't know how to cook. They don't know how to clean. They don't know how to. We'll teach them for for God's exactly. sake. Teach them, and and that's we we preach this among the, the training group we have here. We just had a class earlier this year. Uh, we did a, a workshop on for our new trainers and some of the ones around the county, and we were talking about that concept where. You have these people coming in that, let's say, don't know how to cook, don't know how to mix fuel for a chainsaw, don't know how, whatever. Well, isn't that an opportunity that you get to teach them that? And now they'll know something not only for the rest of their career, but their life. And you're going to side eye that? That's a, it's a gift. So, Were you side eyed? Probably not. You probably had somebody grab you by the ear, bring you over and show you how to do it. A lot. Of so time. why should why should we maybe not grab them by the ear, <laughs> but proverbially proverbially grab them by the ear and show them how to do it? Yes. You know, I'll go back to when I started in the, on the call force. Um, we had, like I said, it was all World War II Korean War vets. We had one guy who uh, Gull Spalding, and and Gull's thing was you damn kids. <laughs> Everything was you damn kids. Well, I can proudly say I was one of those damn kids that took everything that he said to heart and learned from him and passed it along and passed it along and passed it along and along again. And, and, and to this day, I hope that we are doing the same thing to all those other damn kids that need it with whatever lesson that might be. Yeah, I I think this is the perfect way to start closing this up. I think that that idea of uh, what you just said in terms of like there is a lot of potential in this these new people coming on board. There's a lot of potential. There's a lot, like you said, we're in good hands. We are in good hands as long as we are doing our part. It's it's a give and take. It's it's a balance. And I, I love that you, you you were closing with that concept. It's very powerful. Very it's it's needs to be talked about. It needs to be talked about and reinforced over and over again. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm going to do right now is, as I'm wrapping this up is I kind of reflect on some of the things we talked about. And once again, I, I, I always take notes and I always take notes in cursive because Nick, Nick Papa did one day at a conference. I was watching him and I, I saw him do it. I'm like, that looks pretty cool. I'm going to go back to writing cursive. And I started writing cursive. I don't know why, 
But you know, we. But can you read it when you go back to do it, though? I, I can. I can read that. Nobody else can read it because I. Nobody I'm, else. Can, my yeah. handwriting sucks, and I can barely write cursive. But at least I can translate it. But we, we talked about a bunch of things, man, and um, I think that a couple of things I wrote down that are going to have me reflecting going forward is that you mentioned the comment that we say often when we attend these conferences is that the people that need to be here are here. And, you know, how to develop that plus one, how to draw people in. And we, we talked about a couple actionable ways, whether it was like for me, having someone to co-teach with me to bring them in or you diversifying your content now opening that up to multiple other people that maybe just didn't want to see how to throw a ladder. But now, oh, you got a PIO thing going on. Oh, leadership, tactics. You're drawing more people in by diversifying that content. And I thought that was good to talk about. We, um, we talked about the, the acquired structures and, and a lot of training Europe doing up there when you have the ability to do the acquired structures, kind of diversifying that as well. Um, you mentioned a couple of things that stuck with me. In other words, for the fools, creating an environment that's everything your home department isn't and focusing on the ideals that basically started with the fools and, and, and keeping those is pretty powerful. Um, you mentioned the idea of a battery recharge, and I think that was powerful too. And no matter what that looks like in terms of a conference or a gathering or a meeting, or whatever, providing that ability to recharge your batteries with the people that you're surrounding yourself with. Because they're, they're, for the most part, those are the people that are in the job, they're powerful. Um, I, I love that we went into that idea of being where you are, being present and engaged, and, and just focus on where you are at that time. And I think that whole concept is something we can talk about for hours, but I'm glad you said it. Um, I think that you, you went into reinforcing engagement and then talking about selfish, selfishness lists or self. Am, 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 I, am I making up words? Selflessness? Selflessness. Thank you. You're doing great. <laughs> I'm making up words. <laughs> um, but I love the, our last part of this conversation in which you're not concerned about the fire service in the future. You're, you're happy with it. You're, you're content with the people that we're bringing on. You see a lot of potential in there. But with the caveat that we have to make sure we are doing our jobs. And I think that as we wrap this up, that's one of the things that I'm taking with this as well, is that I'm not worried about the people bringing in as long as we are doing everything in our, in our scope to make sure they're prepared, not only how to do the tactical things, but all the other things that come with a, a career, a life of 25, 30 plus years in the fire service and some things that we're going to teach them, they're going to last a lifetime. And that's that's what I'm leaving with with this conversation. But um, but as we as we kind of close up here, what else is on your horizon? What else do you got going down? Where are you going to be in the next month and the next year? What's what's on your horizon? I said we've got uh, we've got the Northeastern Fire Summit coming up in March. Um, after that, we're going to be up in Williston, Vermont, at some point, um, doing a live fire hands on. We will be in Groton, Mass, April 5 to 8, doing a commercial fireground, hands-on. <clears throat> um, we will be back in Newcastle, New Hampshire sometime before the summer breaks um, to do hands-on. Not sure if it's going to be live fire or not. Uh, Fools International Conference is June, I believe it's the week of June 10th, down in Baton Rouge, uh, which is sure to be a good time. And... Um, Beyond that, that's what we got going on up here in New England, anyway. That's a lot. That's a lot of stuff. It is a lot, and you know, I know, I know, our brothers north of the north of the border um, have Jason Redmond coming in in April, uh, speaking for them as well. It's not a fool's conference per se, but it's uh, it's definitely something if you're looking for a little bit of travel to uh, to see someone who's worthwhile speaking speak. That would definitely be a good one to take in. Um. All right. In terms of, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Please, please, please. Now, I, I, from for me, though, I would like to close with just the fact that um, in November, <clears throat> the New England Fools lost one of our greats. Um, old Mike Clark passed away just shy of the age of seventy-six years old. Um, probably occupational cancer. Um, or it might have been Agent Orange, or it might have been the Trade Centers. Take your pick as to what it was that got him. But this is a guy that was an absolute legend. Um, he did 70 years in the American Fire Service. He started as a volunteer on Long Island at 16. Um, he was a combat-wounded Vietnam vet Marine. Did a career with the city of Hanover, New Hampshire. Uh, he was a mass USAR task force guy. He was a plank owner of the New Hampshire Fire Academy. He, he, he taught for the 
Vermont Fire Academy. He taught for on-scene training. He taught around the world. Um, and Michael was hands down one of the finest human beings you would ever have had the pleasure and the opportunity to meet. And his loss has just left a hole in the heart of the New England Fools as well as the New England Fire Service. So when you talk about engagement and leadership and anything and everything you want to be, Michael Clark was that. Everything you wanted to be was Mike Clark, hands down. No question. That's how it was. So um, he's a special individual and we'll miss him dearly. And he was teaching with us one month to the day of his passing. He was teaching bailouts to students in a RIC class. That's important. So talking, that's something talking else. Talking about like an example of engagement. Oh, engagement it, personified, it, it, right? Look, look it up in the dictionary. He's, he's, he's anything and everything you'd want to be. All right. Well, as we come to a close here, and I'm, I'm speaking to the, the listeners now, I would ask you to, and again, we, we do this for the people listening. You know, we do this for uh, not only just to have the conversation, but it draws out just a bunch of things that we could talk about and have you all self-reflect, and even myself included. You know, what is your vision of, of, of engagement? What is your definition of it? How are you engaging your team as I'm leaving? I always think, okay, I got all these areas of responsibility and uh, areas I, I'm under charge of. Am I engaging with them? How am I demonstrating engagement with them? And I, I leave that this, this conversation with that thought in my mind. Um, so as we kind of close up, I um, just want to make sure, uh, thank everybody for listening once again. Uh, again, I started with this. I started with gratitude. I will end with gratitude. You have a zillion podcasts out there to listen to. I am blessed and, and I am honored to have this platform, but I am just very grateful that you're choosing to listen to this one and, and, and give us your time. Um, I want to thank uh, Rusty for all the, the words and the, the topics here. I wrote a page full of notes like I usually do, so thank you for that. So we need to dive over. Um, uh, FDIC is coming up in April. Um, if you haven't registered yet, it's coming up the uh, middle of April. Um, for this podcast, every second Friday of the month, uh, we do the same thing over and over again. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for everything. Uh, Rusty, I just, this was a great conversation. I really enjoyed this today. I'm glad we went in different directions and that's the purpose of doing this thing. So thank you once again so much. No, thank you. I appreciate it, Steve. Uh, and if it wasn't for the fools, we wouldn't be having this conversation because, you know, you wouldn't have wanted to talk to me otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> what? You know, I want to talk to that guy. You, you wouldn't have known me to, otherwise to want to talk you know, to me. You, you bring up a good point. How would we have known each other otherwise except for through the fools? You know, that's, it's, it's and thank you for the coin, by the way. I got your twenty-year coin. Uh, congratulations for twenty okay. years. Awesome. Um, I will keep this with pride. Um, anyway, so thank you everybody for listening. Thank you all and uh, and the fire injury community out there. It's been a great conversation. Oh, and last question: How can people reach out to you if they need to get in touch about a conference or need to contact you? What's that look like? Any any of our socials, we're on we're on all the social media networks. You can get us through our website nefools.org. Um, we're 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 not hard to get in touch with. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Thank you all for listening. Much appreciated. Thank you, Rusty. Have a wonderful time. Thank you all out there for listening. Have a wonderful and blessed day. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit magnagrip.com.